ACEC is excited to announce that registration is now open for its fall conference taking place in Marco Island, Florida this October. That's right, after a year of Zoom and virtual meetings, we're excited to be bringing our fall conference back as an in-person event. And we can't tell you how excited we are to look forward to seeing you there in person for all of the content, networking, and education that the fall conference is known for. Log on to www.acec.org for more information. We can't wait to see you there. Welcome to the Engineering Influence Podcast presented by the American Council of Engineering Companies and sponsored by the ACEC Life Health Trust. Diversity and inclusion is an important pursuit across U.S. industries and within engineering firms. It's the right thing to do, but it's also a critical component in solving our STEM talent shortage, and studies have found that diverse and inclusive companies perform better in the market. Many engineering firms have established DNI programs, and we have one of the leading firms with us here today. Thornton Tomasetti, which is number 62 on the 2021 ENR 500 list and has more than 1,500 employees worldwide, launched its formal DNI program in 2016 and has continued to build and augment it ever since. Joining us today are Thornton Tomasetti President Wayne Stocks and Senior Principal Peggy Van Eppel. Welcome to the program. Thanks Thank for you. having us. So, back in 2016, DNI was not a mainstream subject. What prompted Thornton Tomasetti to, to start the program? Well, we can actually uh, go back to 2012 uh, with our first sort of formalized corporate responsibility initiative. Uh, we included uh, DNI as one of our eight primary goals, where we uh, decided to focus a little bit on gender and ethnic and uh, racial diversity at Thornton Tomasetti. Uh, so, from that uh, initial effort, we uh, developed in 2016 our first formal EDI committee, like actually just I and D committee, and that committee was primarily senior staff and our our HR, which we call our talent team. Uh, at that point, the mission was to build an inclusive environment where people are respected for who they are and free to thrive. Um, fast forward to uh, 2018, we hired an I, I and D coordinator, which uh, again I think a little unusual for our industry but a good step. And the focus there was just uh, education, elevating certain topics, having a diversity calendar, and a lot of internal communication. We, every, at that point, everything was still pretty much in-house. Um, and then, uh, you know, we got a little more aggressive with programming. We did unconscious bias training, started hosting lunch discussions, presentations, and, uh, and even that, that segued into expanding our parental leave policy in 2018 where we started doing paid time off for both parents. Again, a little bit uh, unusual for our industry, but at the time it seemed like a really a really good change. Um, and then to take us current, we, we shifted to equity, diversity and inclusion in 2019. And that's when we formed our three employee network groups. We had a really good starting point because Women at TT was a very established employee network group. And we added Mosaic, our multicultural group and Spectrum, our LGBTQIA plus group. And, uh, and that was a fairly, I mean, Peggy will add to this, but that was a fairly major uh, cultural shift where we empowered those groups to have an active voice. And uh, Peggy and I as executive advocates, uh, you know, hopefully give it the emphasis that it needs to, uh, to show the importance to the firm. And Peggy, you want to talk a little bit about what we did with our five-year plan? Sure. So coinciding with the expansion to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and the establishment of the employee network groups, we incorporated EDNI into the firm's five-year plan, which goes from 2020 through 2025, to the beginning of 2025. So what we say in our five-year plan is we know diversity drives innovation, so we will set and achieve targeted data-driven goals to increase inclusion and diversity among our staff, leaders, owners, and board of directors. So that being part of our five-year plan uh, has really allowed it to weave into all parts of our business and to show the criticality of what we think we need to do um, in, in the next five years to continue to be a vital firm. Uh, but in terms of 
the reaction of our team to those efforts, I will say going back to 2016, where we established inclusion and diversity committee and started to look at how do we educate our staff on what does inclusion and diversity even mean? Because that really wasn't part of the vocabulary. I'll say that it was really um, much more tempered and mixed at that point. People didn't quite understand the reason we were talking about it. Um, I think that there was just a um, foundational need to, uh, to, to understand why uh, in engineering and in the AEC industry, we needed that. Uh, we had, as Wayne mentioned, in 2017, our unconscious bias training, and uh, there was resistance to, uh, to taking it, um, to engaging. And it's interesting to see how when we um, reintroduced unconscious bias in 2020 amongst uh, the world around us, the social unrest, how much more engaged the staff was. And I think that a lot of it had to do not only with what was going on in the world around us, but also because since 2016, we've been giving staff uh, that education and that dialogue that they needed to even begin to think about it. Um, so I think for us, that was a, a big success to see the contrast between what staff, uh, what the staff's reaction to not the same trainings, but the same topic. Um, Wayne, do you want to just describe a little bit about the unconscious bias training in 2020 and how we structured that? Yeah, Jerry, this was this was really interesting. We 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 looked. There's a lot of sort of uh, there are a lot of toolkits out there, but a lot of them, just like if you do project management training, for example, they don't exactly fit your company or your culture. And then it's also very difficult to do something homemade because they're hard and, and they, they sometimes they flop. But we have some really talented staff. We have some people that do improv on the weekends and. So anyway, each of our three employee network groups did these skits. Um, they were in the Zoom environment, which was kind of interesting because there's a lot of negative things about being apart, as we all know, but it also allowed to do some fairly creative, you know, set changes and, and costumes. But the, the staff did these videos. Uh, it, it spanned probably six or eight offices and, uh, and they were fantastic. I, I mean, you know, the participation, the way we, the way we structured it, we just showed the videos uh, in, a, in a, a large setting and then did small breakout groups to, to discuss it and came back together. So we've, we've had a lot of, uh, we have a series called Conversations to Create Lasting Change, which we started last year and uh, various ENGs lead those. Participation has been great. Um, one of our first calls, we actually broke Zoom. We, we realized our account was too small. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's exciting to see the staff engaging. So what, what Peggy and I have been trying to do with, along with other leaders in the firm is strike a balance between sort of top down and then and, and bottom up so that the employee engagement is genuine and, and they're not doing it because we're saying it's a good thing to do, that it's because they want to. And, you know, it's, it's a work in progress for sure. Well, I would imagine those uh, ENG groups, the uh, employee network groups are sort of, are, are a bottom up organization, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the leaders there um, are, they're they're only they're they're younger than Peggy and I a little bit, but uh, you know they have a lot of influence. They have a lot of access to staff, and uh, I, I have to say that one of the things I'm most proud of is we we are far from done, right? I think we've done a lot of great things. Um, it'll be interesting to, to to keep the momentum and and keep it vital and vibrant. But but what I'm so proud of is when these groups hold a meeting, um, our board of directors is well represented. Our most senior principals are represented leaders throughout the company participate. And uh, I mean, you know, Peggy and I encourage them to participate, but you can't make anybody do anything they don't want to do. And I think when the younger staff uh, see the participation, it, it's very good for everybody. And, and it just sort of keeps the, uh, keeps the momentum going. I think too, Wayne, that it, it's been interesting to see with both the leadership of the employee network groups, as well as, as they begin to form uh, boards or structures around that leadership, the opportunities for developing skills that are not just important for the ENGs, but are important at, for their development as, a, as a, an engineer or as a professional. So they are having the opportunity to interact with our executive committee, our board of directors, uh, when they're engineers or senior engineers, 
Uh, whereas typically in a firm, there's not a lot of uh, points at which an engineer might communicate directly with the board of directors. So just the preparation for that and having that platform, I think is an immense opportunity for people that are involved with these groups. And I think that is part of uh, the, the plan for retention. Uh, because, uh, you, you know, one part of it is the recruitment, and you get a uh, more diverse team in the door, but then the retention and the development of that staff um, to make sure that in the long term, they're part of your firm, the organization and of the leadership requires those kinds of opportunities and fostering them. So that has been, I want to say for me, a little bit of an unexpected benefit mm -hmm. of right. it. Uh, that that there's that type of training that's that's part of um, engaging with the ENGs. Do, do you find that the people who are moving up in the ENGs to sort of lead the programs are sort of uh, on a leadership track for the firm? That's certainly the plan. That's, that's I mean, a, so far that's a good I mean, system. I, yeah, um, I mean, you know, it's 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 a bit tricky because if you're not careful, you can. You can sort of miss that balance of like you opened with it's the right thing to do i think we can mostly agree on that there's also a business justification but if you go too far one way or the other you'll lose your audience so we don't know what that balance looks like but as i mentioned our, our women at tt group is, is very active i mean they've been uh, they have a board they have very uh, established committees they have elections um you know, they have their own constitution it's it's quite impressive they're several years ahead of the other two ENGs, but it's actually what gave us the confidence to, to try this in this structure. I mean, other firms are doing employee resource groups or network groups, it's, or, you know, it's not, we didn't invent this, of course, but given the success of women at TT, we had a really good anchor to model the other two groups around. And uh, so we're, we're trying to effectively accelerate those without, you know, doing things that aren't genuine. And, uh, but, but no, definitely the people that are active in those groups as Peggy said, they get practice and access, and you know, it's not their career path, right? It's but it's they also have to be excellent architects or scientists or engineers. But everything we do is related to communication, so they get a, a excellent exposure on that as well. So it's it's been really, like Peggy said, uh, it's really fun to watch uh, because it's really smart people, and if they're passionate about something, whether it's a bridge design or a building design or an investigation or an unconscious bias training. If they decide to do it well, that's what happens. And so we're 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 trying to steer and support and stay out of the way. How does it work? You have fifty offices. You're around the world. How does how does this work in in that structure? Seamlessly. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's tricky. Um, I think that you know. Again, I, I we all say there's. I don't ever say the good thing about COVID. But it has been interesting that it, even these unconscious bias videos that we did, the skits, we were able to incorporate people in various locations. And when we did it back in uh, 17, our first round, it was very office focused. So a small office wouldn't really get exposure or access to the other leadership or the other staff that's interested in this. And in a Zoom environment, you assemble people that you might not have assembled. So we're doing anti-racism discussions with people in the Middle East and UK and and, and India, along with China and here. And really interesting discussions. And, you know, the initial reaction for a lot of people is, well, that doesn't apply to me, or that doesn't, it's not our country or not our culture. We don't have that problem. But you see the light bulbs go off as, as people, you know, on the screen look around and, and the, the discussions are really healthy. And, uh, you know, awareness isn't enough, but it's a good starting point. And then the following discussions are easier. And, and like Peggy mentioned earlier, uh, our collective vocabulary is better now you know, a lot more to do, but, but we have the foundational vocabulary, I think, to continue the discussions. It's been interesting, too, to see that, for example, with the unconscious bias training, most of the people who developed the video skits were in the United States. Right. And we had assumed that the skits would fall flat or not be relevant, for example, in our Mumbai office. And we received a request to actually view the unconscious bias um, by uh, videos by our Mumbai office. And they actually found them very relevant, 
Now it's a slightly different environment there, but the points of the videos uh, they found helpful and mm -hmm. they had helpful discussion. So it's been interesting being an international firm, thinking about the training and um, the educational materials and how uh, relevant, how uh, important those particular topics are to offices that are outside of the United States. Uh, so that's been a good learning, mm -hmm. um, learning point for us. And then as Wayne was saying, it's been really interesting for us in the Zoom environment where whether it was the discussion groups for unconscious bias or one of the other many discussion groups we had where you are engaging with people in other offices and they are giving you their perspective of that particular topic, whether it's you know, us in DC here versus someone in Kansas, you know, versus somebody in London. And it really helps you get outside of your immediate sphere and, and think about what are, what are uh, those particular topics, how relevant they are in those environments. And so I think that it's allowed us to broaden our horizons quite a bit and also to talk to our colleagues. I mean, a lot of the colleagues I was on the calls with, Wayne, I didn't, I've never met them before right, right. or had anything beyond um, professional conversation with them. And people have a tendency to open up about their personal experiences, whether it's their family or, you know, where they grew up, or there's, there's a lot of things that people open up about, which I think creates those bonds that are beyond the professional bonds. And I'm hoping in the long term will help mm -hmm. our firm uh, just retain staff uh, because people feel more understood. That's a definite benefit, I would say. What, what about, um, does this have any uh, impact on your clients? Do, is this an issue for them that you guys are leading the way here? It's funny when we were we were talking a little bit this morning, um, you know, it, things have changed rapidly because we are now seeing very specific questions uh, in, in RFPs. And one really interesting discussion we had with a client, uh, we were talking to them about potential potentially working together and they asked for for our not like a policy statement. It wasn't quite that formal, but they said, what are you what are you guys doing around equity, diversity and inclusion? And we, we, we gave, you know, we put them to our website. We have a few annual reports where there's fairly decent, uh, you know, stories and documentations and discussions. But uh, they asked for, uh, what do you have in print? And we're like, what do you mean? And so they, what they wanted to know is they wanted to know what you were doing two or three years ago versus what you say you're going to do. So we're finding people that they, they want to know if you're, if you're doing it now because you're supposed to or if you've been doing it because it's part of who you are. And uh, I mean, Peggy is working with our marketing team to have a little more of a consistent response so that in, in places that maybe aren't aware of some of the things we're doing, some smaller offices maybe, but they understand what our total package looks like, but not, not to formalize it, but just to be consistent. And, uh, you know, Peggy can tell you in, in, in certain RFPs, the questions are very specific and it's not optional, right? This is not, uh, like, do you have a do you have an office in Vancouver? Yes or no, and they don't care, right? They they care, right? And and Jerry, uh, the importance of it to our clients and to our business is so much of a focus that at our annual owners meeting this past May, we had a segment that I spoke to where we reviewed with all the owners the points at which, whether it's a request for proposal or interviews um, or specific forms that you have to fill out or even conversations with clients, that it touches all of those parts of our business and that we can't have, um, we can't have no answer to that, right? And as Wayne was saying, we're working to develop uh, not just consistent answers, but also just have, uh, you know, depth of the answers. Right. Uh, so we are, are making sure that our owners um, are aware of that, are engaged with that, and that they understand very clearly that this is going to continue to be a uh, critical part of uh, driving our business in the future. 
uh, for our clients uh, and for our colleagues in, in the industry. So where do you see the program going? Where, uh, what, what, what are your points of emphasis right now? So the points of emphasis now are looking at our five-year plan. We are in 2021 or ending 2021, and uh, we want to achieve our five-year plan by the end of 2024. So we are focusing on continued education uh, to increase inclusivity. This year, we had a three-part anti-racism training uh, that uh, our staff was uh, not required to take, but certainly very much encouraged to take, uh, followed on with discussions. Wayne and I were talking about, do we continue to have that anti-racism training next year? How do we take it to the next level um, to keep it fresh, to keep, it to keep the staff engaged? We're also looking at recruitment and retention and development programs for the diverse talent, as I mentioned earlier. So we've changed our recruitment methods. Um, we're looking at going to different schools, different universities, um, widening our reach. Uh, we're also looking at establishing or continuing to establish the data-driven goals. So we've done this uh, for our women owners of the firm. We have a commitment to double the number of women owners by the end of 2024. Uh, right now, we have 35% of our staff is non-white ethnicity or race, and 31% of our staff is women. We're looking at, across the staff profile, where do we want to be at the end of 2024? Where do we want to be also with our leadership? Uh, then engagement with our communities and groups, um, and the communities and groups that are underrepresented in the AAC community uh, through continued involvement with the ACE program. Uh, that Thornton Thomas Eddy established and with scholarships. So we look at all of those as the components that we need to work on for the five-year plan. Uh, we speak to them just as bullets, but they are all uh, quite, uh, require quite a bit of, of work. Uh, so as Wayne said, we, we appreciate that we've been able to get here uh, since 2012 really, but we know we have a lot of work to do by 2024. So that's the focus currently and for the next couple of years for us. What, one thing I'll add to that is it's, it's really interesting to, to have sort of general discussions about what your goals should be. And, you know, as, as engineers and scientists, and we're, we're pretty good with the developing a design criteria and then following it. But you have to establish what problem you're trying to solve. And it, it's, not, it's not uniformly understood what the problem definition really is. So you find yourself running off in different directions, uh, doing good things, I think, but you know, what's, the, uh, what's the glue that holds those things together and the why? And you know, our staff, like I said, it, it's really smart people, really driven, passionate. If, if we can explain uh, sort of the, it's the right thing to do, the business side of it, the opportunities for growth and development, and it will make us better and more vital. Uh, you know, I think that's our best chance for success. And one of the things that's interesting is, you know, how do you, how do you keep this discussion going in the absence of some major event? Because last year, we were very fortunate to have these groups in place because uh, the, the timing was lucky. We, we were not equipped to have these conversations four years ago. And, and we, again, nothing perfect about it, but at least there was a, an opportunity. And, uh, you know, we, we sort of turned that into uh, on Pride Day, we had a really, really rich discussion that our Spectrum group led. And it was eye-opening because people that thought they were inclusive and understanding and, and allies and helpful, you hear stories from people in our own internal community uh, about what they face and, and, and how they have to deal with certain things every day uh, that, that if you're privileged and don't have to deal with that, you can't imagine. And I think like Peggy said, just hearing that, um, it, it impacts how we work with each other because we're doing really hard projects with tight deadlines and you know you make a mistake you got to fix it you got to really trust the people you're around and and understanding them better clearly makes that a much more achievable goal if if you have that understanding in, in closing the, the buy-in from your employees I, I mean it sounds like it's i mean you mentioned from 2017 to 2020 on the uh on the unconscious bias, it, it sounds like you have a lot of buy-in from, from the from the 1,500 team members. Is that so? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I credit our employee network groups. So I think that, like I said, we're trying to, we're trying to 
give the opportunity for the discussions to happen, but you can't force participation. And like like Peggy mentioned, we we go back and forth between making certain things required, like like our sexual harassment prevention training is required by law. So, um, but but doing it now compared to five years ago, um, you know, the tracking down the people that that can't quite get it closed out, the, the numbers are much less. So, uh, a, a lot of credit to our staff. It's uh, but again, I, I I don't know how to say this correctly, but we, we are so far from done, and and we we hesitate in a way to even um, be pleased with what's happened because we don't we don't think it's enough, and we we don't exactly know what what's next. But um, I think just open minds and continued focus, and we'll get to a better place. But uh, it's it's hard to think about. I mean, you don't want to you don't want to cheapen it and, and have it turn into self-promotion but you also don't want to say nothing because um again I'll, i keep going back to women at tt several firms have reached out to us and and gotten our input uh on, on how to set up a similar program because it's really really good and, and we're hopeful that our next two groups will be models eventually as well uh, but it's definitely a work in progress i'll say too jerry that it's been really exciting to see that events that our different groups are holding, and, and, and now we're transitioning into this post-COVID uh, or getting beyond COVID world where we're trying to engage everybody in person as much as we can, because it is very different. Uh, and the two ENGs that were established in 2020, essentially everything they have done has been virtual. So that, that makes it much more challenging to create traction uh, in some ways. So we've been encouraging uh, the staff to do what they can in person. So for example, in the last month, we had the 101 mile walking challenge, which is in celebration of uh, women's suffrage. It and wasn't in a single day, don't, don't pay. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> so that was the month of, the month of September. Uh, we challenged all of our staff to walk 101 miles. And it's really exciting to see the engagement, not just by the women, but across the staff. In Washington, DC specifically, we hosted uh, tours every week where we would walk from the office and we would go over to projects that our women staff worked on or led. And it was really great to see that the people who attended these walks were not just the women in the office, but the men in the office. Um, similarly, upcoming, we have our celebration in Washington, D.C. and across the firm of Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, our plan in Washington, D.C. is to have a gathering on our rooftop and bring in a, a dance instructor. So get ready, Wayne. Oh, boy. But uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward again to seeing the whole staff participate in that and, and learn about uh, Hispanic heritage. So just seeing that staff is, because I think the tendency maybe five years ago is if a woman, there was a women's event, that it was only attended by women, right? Now there is genuine interest. We're not forcing anyone to attend these events. So I think that's pretty exciting and signifies to me that we are making lasting cultural change to our to our firm. So I'm excited to see where it's going to go in the next few years. Yeah, it's, it's also been fun to, you know, certain events are for just women. And, and we talked about how we need to be a little clear, is, is that group sponsoring an event or is it for them? And so we had to get a little more intentional about you know, the secret code, like, okay, you can come to this one, not that one. But uh, so in, in DC, there's a very active group. So I'll show up at a meeting sometimes and, and I'll say, I'm happy to leave whatever the discussion doesn't include me. And if it's a book group discussion, I'll stay for a while and then I'll leave or, or, or not leave. But uh, each group, uh, in each location across the company has their own their own style. I mean, you know, what works here doesn't work in Albuquerque or San Francisco or, or New York. Uh, we have smaller offices, larger offices. And, uh, you know, the, the 101 mile challenge was for this year, last year was a 100 mile challenge. And uh, really, really great participation. People post photos and you get discussion groups on our internal, uh, we call it Spark. Uh, it's built on the Jive platform. So it's a very rich environment for sharing stories and information and commenting. Um, you know, I, but like Peggy said, I think the, the transition out a bit back in person is really exciting because we've we've had some virtual meetings with other companies 
where our committee will talk with other committees and find out what they're doing. Um, a, a lot of great exchange and you can always walk away from those discussions. Um, I did one with North Carolina State University. You, you walk away with thinking, okay, we're doing some pretty cool stuff, but had not thought about that. And you just keep adding, you know, adding to your, your, your opportunities to do, to do different things. So it's exciting. I, but I think our engagement is really good. Um, but I think it's because that's, it's, it's what people want to be doing. And, and we're, we're trying to err on the side of giving opportunity and, and not forcing. Great. It, it, I, I guess the message there is it's always a journey, not a destination sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's really interesting talking to you. I appreciate the opportunity. And you've been listening to the Engineering Influence Podcast presented by ACC and sponsored by the ACC Life Health Trust. Thanks for listening. Thank you.